2020 was dominated by the global pandemic and subsequent fallout. For the first time in living memory, the vast majority of people worldwide were forced to live in a drastically different manner. With millions inevitably turning towards the stock market, brokerages like Robinhood would be poised to see explosive growth, even in the face of economic calamity. As a quick disclosure, I am not an investment professional, so please make sure to talk to a financial planner and do your own research before you begin investing. If you enjoy this video, it would be great if you could like and subscribe. Purchasing shares of ownership in a company has long been viewed as a game played by just the wealthy. For most of history, this has been true. For nearly 200 years, brokers charged fixed rate commissions on retail investors. At one point, executing a single trade could cost upwards of $100. However, new regulation from the Securities and Exchange Commission in the 1970s pushed the price down to $70 per trade. In the 1990s, newer brokerages such as E-Trade began to use online trading to significantly lower costs to below $20. Up to even 2013, the cheapest online brokers still charged $5 per trade. Such costs severely handicapped retail investors and deterred millions from even considering entering the stock market. This is highly problematic because when used correctly, the stock market is one of the best tools to build and maintain wealth. Vlad Tenev and Beiju Bot, two Stanford graduates working on Wall Street, quickly noticed the disparity between the large firms and everyday Americans when it came to investing. In 2013, with just $3 million in venture capital, the duo moved to Menlo Park, California, and began working on a new type of brokerage. Seeking to democratize finance for all, the new brokerage was called Robin Hood, after the English legend who stole from the rich to give to the poor. Robin Hood would be different from the older brokerage incumbents in a few key manners. First, the brokerage was designed to be used primarily from a smartphone. Bot, who took charge of the interface design, focused intently on making the app clean, simple, and streamlined. Seeking the preference of a younger audience, Bot would often walk to his neighboring alma mater and see what features of the platform Stanford students enjoyed. Reducing the amount of content on screen avoids overloading the user with information, so whatever is visible is clear and concise. Second, the onboarding process was designed to be easy, swift, and efficient, often taking less than five minutes. Once within the app, users are given a free stock to begin their investing journey, and Robinhood's trademark confetti rains down the screen to celebrate the occasion. Users are further encouraged to buy more shares by looking at lists of popular and trending stocks. Users can also get a free stock for every person they refer the app to, ranging from a penny stock to blue chip stocks such as Facebook and Microsoft. Finally, it would be Robinhood's approach to investment fees that would truly change the brokerage industry. Even though trading commission prices had been falling for decades, Robinhood finally eliminated them altogether. Additionally, there were no account minimums. All that was needed to invest with Robinhood was a bank account. Later on, Robinhood would also add fractional shares to its offerings. Now, all you needed to buy a share of any publicly traded US company was just $1. Bot and Tenev faced an immense task, challenging established brokers such as Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, and E-Trade, who collectively managed trillions of dollars of assets. In order to capture the allure of exclusivity, they restricted access, building up a waitlist of 50,000 people in 2013. Prospective users could move up the waitlist by referring friends. When the app launched in 2015, the waitlist had grown to more than 800,000 people, at almost no marketing expense. From 2017 to December of 2019, the number of users would grow from 2 million to 10 million. In its short lifetime, Robinhood has had a noticeable influence on the brokerage industry. Younger investors have flocked to the Sleek app. The median user age is 30 with devoted users checking in on their investments upwards of 10 times a day. Robinhood's largest impact has to be the near-unanimous abolition of trading fees. On October 1st, 2019, industry titan Charles Schwab did away with online commissions. The next day, TD Ameritrade and E-Trade announced they would do the same. At the same time, TD was still charging nearly $7 per trade. Each company's stock briefly fell, Schwab by 10%, TD up to 26%. Eventually, Robinhood's actions would indirectly lead to Schwab acquiring TD and E-Trade being absorbed by Morgan Stanley. Robinhood, however, had in six years morphed from a two-person startup into a force to be reckoned with in an industry dominated by trillion-dollar investment banks. By March 2020, it was clear that the year would be unlike any other. 
a new pandemic had gripped the world by its throat. Millions of businesses and people were pushed to the brink, but not Robin Hood. People's lives were stripped of even the most common everyday occurrences, and thus many began to invest in the stock market as a form of entertainment. Instead of buying a coffee at a local cafe, some bought shares of Starbucks. Barstool Sports founder Dave Portnoy made headlines by turning to volatile day trading to satiate cravings typically fed by sports gambling. The $1,200 stimulus checks that arrived in March were funneled directly into millions of brokerage accounts. From January through March, Schwab, TD, and E-Trade had collectively gained 1.7 million new funded accounts. Robinhood nearly doubled them, with over 3 million new users. Many more had already opened an account with Robinhood, but had never made an investment before 2020. The most common reason was waiting for a time to buy in. The short-lived bear market and rock-bottom interest rates would prove to offer the perfect opportunity. While many Robinhood investors followed a traditional buy-and-hold strategy, most of the news surrounding Robinhood focused on the questionable trading strategies of users such as Portnoy. Some retail investors focused on industries battered by the pandemic, but soon turned to penny stocks, companies in bankruptcy, and options trading. The riskier trading tactics have also been amplified through social media, with influencers on Reddit and TikTok posting their massive gains or often humiliating losses. The New York Times reported that Robinhood users traded 88 times the number of options contracts as Schwab customers. By the end of 2020, still in the midst of a global pandemic, Robinhood boasted 13 million users. Plans to expand intercontinentally were put on hold as more staff was brought on to handle domestic growth. The influx of users and revenue has also pushed Robinhood closer to an IPO, with an estimated valuation of $11.2 billion as of August. With Robinhood's meteoric rise comes inevitable criticism. The platform has been plagued with outages in which users cannot access their accounts or buy and sell stocks and options. As of September 3rd, 2020, Robinhood had 63 outages, less than 68 at TD, but triple the 20 experienced by Schwab. The most egregious case occurred on Monday, March 2nd, when Robinhood was down for the entire day in the midst of the country bracing for the pandemic. Robinhood has also faced questions about the manner in which it makes money. With no commission fees, the revenue has to be made up using other means. Robinhood's subscription service, Robinhood Gold, costs $5 a month and offers more research tools, after-hours trading, and trading on margin. Other methods include income generated from stock loans, cash stored in interest-bearing bank accounts, and cash management through Robinhood's debit card. But rebates from market makers accounts for the majority of Robinhood's revenue. Otherwise known as payment for order flow, the practice is used by other brokerages, including Schwab and TD, but lacks transparency. To quickly summarize, Market makers, such as Citadel Securities, will pay Robinhood to sell stocks and options to Robinhood customers. I have linked a more detailed article in the description, but this essentially means that Robinhood users may not be getting the best price available on their investments. This is also somewhat contradictory to Robinhood's notion of helping the little guy by offering free commission, but then selling their trade requests to rich market makers. In the first half of 2020, Robinhood made $270 million from order flow. Likewise, Robinhood gets paid more for options trades executed by their customers. While Robinhood claims only 12% of customers trade options, those trades accounted for 62% of Robinhood's order flow revenue. This leads to perhaps the most controversial argument against Robinhood, the gamification of investing. The dazzling touches to the app, such as confetti, neon coloring, and lists of popular stocks, have been criticized as nudging inexperienced investors towards riskier trades. The riskier the trade and the more often that users pursue them, the more Robinhood is paid. The app's interface shares characteristics of what can be called dark patterns or design choices that steer users down a desired path. Robinhood's colors, saturated green and red, act as psychological cues to make people feel like they're winning or losing, which can lead to impulsive buying and selling. Meanwhile, safer index funds and ETFs are not advertised to the same degree as popular stocks. Robinhood has published some personal finance education materials via Robinhood Learn, but is extremely difficult to find on the app. And while it has seen 3.2 million visits in 2020, this represents less than a quarter of all Robinhood users. In late 2020, lawsuits were brought forth concerning Robinhood's practices. Robinhood agreed to pay $65 million to settle a case with the SEC after it failed to fully disclose its practice of payment for order flow. Meanwhile, Massachusetts regulators filed a complaint for exposing investors to unnecessary risks associated with trading. They alleged that Robinhood aggressively marketed to inexperienced investors and failed to ensure proper controls were implemented to protect them. 
While these lawsuits certainly create a case to argue against Robinhood, they completely neglect many of the important features that the brokerage has brought to the retail investor. One could contest that payment for order flow is worth it in order to eliminate trade fees, which eventually became the industry norm. This has brought more people than ever into the market and has allowed young investors to begin to take control of their financial future. Many, if not most, Robinhood users have seen lots of success as they have targeted high growth tech stocks. Robinhood still has plenty of room to grow as well. Eventually, tax advantaged accounts such as IRAs could be added. Intercontinental expansion, as well as going public, are also on the horizon. Until then, Robinhood will be what it always has been, a company that leverages technology to encourage everyone to participate in our financial system. If you guys are interested in any further reading on this topic, I have listed my sources below. And if you enjoyed the video, please remember to like and subscribe. It goes a long way in helping me build the channel. Thanks, and I'll see you guys in the next one. On a final note, a lot has happened with Robinhood between when I started working on this video and now, early February 2021. I want to make it clear that the purpose of this video is to review the history of Robinhood and present the story of the firm in the most objective way possible. The goal is to highlight the undeniable effects that the relatively young firm has had on an established brokerage industry. I am not a financial advisor and am in no way trying to advocate for or against the use of Robinhood. Thanks.